being in a finance department, I'm a little bit outside the area of many of the things that we're talking about today. Uh, but I work with Prasanna Tambay, who is in IOMS. And you know, I'll, I'll just talk very briefly about this paper. Um, one thing that was talked about before, I think, in the, in the presentation, uh, at least in, in the context of this conference, is understanding the role uh, that various types of innovations play in affecting various stakeholders. And, and one type of stakeholder that we've talked a lot about, at least in the press, uh, and certainly, in the, in the, and I'll talk about in the recent presidential election, is understanding how a lot of innovation and technological change impact workers. Okay, so many of you guys probably remember, uh, in the recent presidential election, there was a lot of debate uh, about the role Mitt Romney played at Bain, Bain Capital and how some of the changes that they had made at companies impacted workers both in the short run and the long run. So <coughs> I'll, I'll sort of talk about this paper and then tie it more to some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, but there's been a lot of research, at least in finance and economics, looking at private equity more generally and trying to understand sort of two things. Number one, what's actually happening in many of the firms that get acquired by private equity investors? And number two, what happens to the workers following these transactions? Okay. Now, there's been a lot of work, at least in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, or, or sort of looking at the LBO wave that has taken place. And there have been a lot of scholars who have argued that what's really been happening is that private equity investors, unlike the 80s, in the last 10 to 15 years, what they've really been doing is buying out these companies and upgrading the underlying technologies uh, that are used by many of these firms. And so there have been some papers <coughs> which look at changes in how work is organized, uh, the types of skills that, that are required within these firms, and the types of um, sort of technologies that are put in place. But there's a lot of debate as to whether or not some of the value creation that, that's, that's generated in these firms, what implication that has for some of the workers. Okay? And you can imagine that if you have a firm that just all of a sudden gets bought out by an investor that wants to implement some new technologies, that might be very costly for many of the workers at the firm, particularly those who either get substituted away and maybe laid off because those technologies displace them. And even for those who might work with the technologies, you might think that, well, they're not as important or in certain ways they're, they're uh, maybe not as critical as they were before. And that's sort of the view that many people have, uh, sort of concerned about how technology might adversely affect many of the employees at, at certain firms. So anyway, so th the, the starting point here, though, is that thinking about there's sort of all these issues floating around, but we really have no data or understanding for what actually happens in practice. And that's sort of the, the starting point for this paper. We want to look at the context, <coughs> uh, at least in the last 10 to 15 years, what has actually happened to workers in the long run following private equity acquisition. Okay? So just to, <coughs> just to frame the sort of question and think about, uh, you can even apply this more generally, if you had to think about how technology or, or innovation or something like that might impact workers in the long run, you might want to think about the following thought experiment. Suppose you could just look at two very similar people, okay, let's call them identical, theoretically, two identical people who join two otherwise identical firms, okay, and suppose one of them gets bought out in an, in an LBO, okay, private equity acquisition. What you'd like to know is what actually happens to the workers at these two firms in, let's say, the next 10 to 15 years. Okay? And you can imagine you'd think about this in many contexts. Suppose you introduce some new technology into a firm. What happens to the workers at one firm versus another? Okay? And what we do is <coughs> we sort of think about this thought experiment, and we'll talk about what we do. We, we collect some data in which we think we can approximate this experiment. And one thing that we look at is if you compare person A, let's say person A versus person B, over the next 10 to 15 years, what fraction of that time does each person have a job? Okay, so one concern about technology is that it might displace workers, workers with obsolete skills might not be able to get a new job, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing we look at is, over time, what actually happens to the workers in a private equity acquisition versus those who are not involved in a private equity acquisition? And we find something very surprising, that if you look at how these people's career outcomes look, in the long run, the person who's actually been hit by an LBO is employed for a longer fraction of time relative to person B. Okay, and this is sort of for the average person at each of these firms. And we think this is surprising because we would think that many times, if you imagine you know, Bain Capital or Mitt Romney coming in, buying out this company, just sort of shelving half the workers, and then many of them just have trouble finding a new job. If you actually look at the data, you do not see that, okay, at least for the, for the average worker. And so what we do in our paper <coughs> is try to, so we, we sort of present this fact, which is a bit surprising, and then we put forth uh, the following explanation, which is sort of two parts, but very straightforward. That what's really happening is that when these companies are bought out by private equity investors, 
two things are happening. Number one, that these investors are upgrading the technologies of the companies that they acquire. And number two, many, but not all, many of the workers actually acquire complementary skills as a result of these investments. And you see that these skills that they acquire are manifest in the types of labor outcomes that we think matter, such as their ability to get a new job in the long run. Okay? So one thing that we do in this paper, <coughs> and we'll talk about the data in a second, is that we'll look in, in great detail at the types of tasks that workers are performing within these firms. And so it is clear, and so we're not trying to argue that all workers benefit from these changes, but it's clear that there are positive beneficial effects that we typically don't think about when you think about this debate about private equity. In particular, if you look at workers who are performing tasks within firms, such as problem solving, making decisions, processing information, tasks in, at, in which at least the labor literature has found to be highly complementary to information technology, you will see that actually many of these workers acquire new skills that enable them to get new jobs at firms that also have demand for new technology. Okay. So how do we actually get the data to sort of approximate this experiment? So we have collected data from a very interesting source. We've collected resume information from one of the largest job search websites in the US, where you can imagine this is sort of a sample resume for a given worker. At one of these websites, if you want to find a job, you can post your resume. Probably many of us have used these sites. You post your resume with information about where you went to school, where you've worked, et cetera, et cetera. And if a company wants to hire you, they'll sort of typically contact the company, go through the resumes, and identify the types of workers that they want. So what we've done is we've collected access to resumes for around 20 to 30 million US workers, where for each worker, we'll typically have information such as where they went to school. And importantly, for each job, we will know where they, where they worked, the start and end dates for each position, and what they did within the firm. Okay, so we'll have very detailed information for the types of tasks that they're performing in, in the company. And what we'll do is we'll then merge this data with two other data sets. The first one is from the Department of Labor, where for each worker we will identify the types of tasks and the occupation that they have at that firm. And that will tell us in great detail to what extent are you performing tasks such as processing information, making decisions, using, uh, using sort of groups to handle your work, et cetera. And then we'll also merge this data with Capital IQ, which will give us information about the types of companies, their balance sheet, whether they get acquired by LBOs or not, et cetera, et cetera. So all we're doing is a very simple thing. You can collect data on people's resumes okay, and get a sense if somebody was, let's say, hit by an LBO in their first job, from their resume, what does the rest of their resume look like? Okay, th so this is kind of an interesting thing that we're, we're sort of accessing this interesting data source to see what happens as a result of various changes that take place in certain companies. So in, in our context, we're, we're specifically interested in private equity, but you can imagine that if you could look at, let's say, 20 to 30 million US resumes, you could get a sense for if somebody worked at a particular company, what happens to them in the long run? And that's a big question right now more generally. Uh, as many people have been looking at the very high unemployment rate and are concerned that many of the people who are unemployed may not have the skills that we would like them to have had. Okay. So given this data, <coughs> I'll just sort of talk about, there's many results in the paper, I'll just talk about sort of who's in this resume database and, and what are some, some key things that we find. So the first thing that's just of general interest is understanding what are the types of people that are going to be looking uh, for a job through an online resource versus other resources. So what we've done is <coughs> here in the sort of left-hand column describe sort of our sample versus the U.S. labor force. And what you find, for example, are, are two different things or, or several things. One is that uh, obviously the people who use a resume database are going to be different from the average U.S. worker. So right off the bat, you'll see that it's much more likely that women are going to be using resume job search websites relative to men. Okay, and that's, it's probably related to the types of occupations you can find. In our sample, around 52% of the users are female, whereas in the U.S. labor force, only around 47% of the workers are female. If you look at education, you find some interesting things. Uh, we have a higher fraction of people in our database who, you, who have gone to college which makes sense that usually within college educated people are more likely to use these sites. But you also see that around one third, of around at least 27% of our sample is high school educated only. So even people who you think may not have sort of the skills that would be relevant for online job search websites, uh, they're actually using the, the, these uh, resources quite prominently. Similarly, if you look at the types of industries in which people work and the types of occupations that they have, it's clear that if you work in places like finance, real estate, business, that you're much more likely to use a resume website versus somebody in the, in the US labor force. Similarly, types of jobs such as healthcare, 
uh, construction, et cetera, you're much less likely to have to use an online job search uh, website to find a job. Okay, so but, but the key thing is that we're, we're picking up a broad swath of people uh, in various occupations who use these sites, and it's likely that over time it's, it's probably going to increase. Okay, so given this data, there's sort of two things that we find. The first is that if you look at, so what this chart shows you is sort of comparing person A versus person B, but looking at different groups of people based on when they leave the firm after an LBO. Okay, so imagine uh, Bain Capital comes to your company, and many people over the next five to 10 years are going to either stay at the firm or leave the firm. So what we've done here is look, sort of broken up people into four groups. Those people who leave within six months, over here. People who leave within 1.3 years. People who leave within 2.5 years. And then people who leave after that. And what you find are sort of two interesting facts. The first is that people who leave within 1.3 years, if you look at how their career paths look in terms of how easily they're able to get a job after this LBO, there's sort of no difference between person A and person B. Okay, both people are able to hold a job for the same fraction of time after this transaction, which is kind of surprising because you would think that many of the people who leave immediately after an LBO, let's say people who were laid off or fired, et cetera, you might think that they would have a relatively difficult time finding a job after this transaction, but you don't see this in the data. The second thing that we think is interesting is that people who do stay at least 1.3 years, uh, based on our data, uh, they're actually improving their <coughs> sort of what we'll call employment durations by around 10 to 15 percent. So what that means is if you look at a person for a given year, somebody who's been employed at an LBO company will be employed for 10 to 15 percent longer time per year for every year after that transaction. The second thing that we'll find is, is and so that's sort of one part of the paper, and we go into that in, in much more detail. A second thing is just looking at what are the sorts of technolo technological changes that are taking place at these companies. So there's really not very good data on whether a company is upgrading its technology or not. So many of the issues that we've talked about, even when I was listening, uh, we care about these big questions like, well, how would technology impact workers? Uh, but you can imagine that it's even very hard to quantify and compare technological investment from one company versus another. So what we've done here, Sunny's done a lot of work on this, and, and it's, it's gotten quite popular, looking at rates of IT employment sort of increasing after certain transactions. So what you see is that typically, if a company wants to upgrade, it, upgrade its IT, they'll invest in hiring many more IT workers who will be able to implement these systems. And what you see is that following these transactions, particularly in the last seven, I would say seven to 10 years, where IT diffusion rates have been relatively high, you're seeing that following these transactions, private equity investors are really ramping up IT investment in, at these firms. Okay, so there's much more in the paper, but what you know, we just want to show, sort of just summarize some of the things that we find, uh, that number one, that following private equity transactions, many of the workers who are hit by these transactions are actually benefiting from skills that they acquire as a result of these investments. Firms are upgrading their ITs following these transactions, and then in the paper we look at what are the types of firms that these guys are relocating to after the LBO, and what you find is that there's this sort of bifurcation in terms of the career paths of people. There's many people who sort of don't really benefit from the technology directly, and for them, they, they're sort of not showing any improvement in their employment outcomes. But then there's a large mass of workers who are not only picking up these skills, but they're able to join companies that actually have demand for, for some of the skills that they're acquired uh, that are related to these new technologies. Okay? And we think that this is interesting because <coughs> in this debate, when you think about a lot of these big topics, you know, it's sort of in this conference, so, so what's the big picture? In this conference, we're talking a lot about technology, how some of the advances that are being made and how it impacts various parts of society. If you go outside this room and you talk to many people who don't think so much about technology, you look at large things like changes in financial markets, private equity investors, et cetera, et cetera, we don't have much of a notion for how very basic financial transactions impact workers. And we think that looking at how technology is, is related to many of these transactions would be useful for, for answering some of those questions. That's it. Thanks.